We're doing a part two of last week's logic games class covering the setup for a conditional in out logic game that I wrote. Here is the recording to last week's class for those who may want to check it out. And here is the link to the game that we'll be working through. We covered it last week, so we're not going to spend a ton of time focused on the setup in particular. We'll spend more time on the questions. I'll do a brief recap of the setup and then we'll get into it. Take a look at that link to the game in the chat and I'll start slowly, slowly setting it up along with all of you, for those who may not have seen it before, but I'll focus on getting us through this setup and understanding how to interpret it as we get into the questions. So this is the legislator game, seven bills, lots of conditional statements. Does anybody who was here last week want to give us a quick overview of the process here, how you might go about it? This is a good way for you to clarify your understanding and make sure that you've truly got it. Just in, in general, the process of how you might go about setting up a game like this with lots of conditional statements. Anyone who was here last week want to give a brief recap of what that process might look like? Just give me a little bit of guidance on how to, I might go about this and then I'll, I'll walk through the steps. Um, what I remember is essentially um, reading through all of the um, rules first and then when you're going through each rule and annotating it, essentially connecting it as you go and taking the contrapositive. So you're creating two separate um, links, one with the, the main, what the rules tell you, and then the contrapositive of that. Um, and then skipping rules um, as you go, unless they connect to something you already have written down. Thanks, Casey. Yeah, that's exactly it. So we've got several conditional statements here. And we're looking to take contrapositives and link those statements together as we go. Meaning we might skip a rule and come back to it if it doesn't automatically link, but we're looking to build two long conditional chains that are the contrapositives of each other. So first rule is gun control only if against environment. So gun, arrow, not environment. What's the contrapositive? We're taking the reversal of variables around the arrow and we're negating both. Now we'll look at rule two as well. Yeah, so contrapositive of this one, reverse the order to negate. Can somebody give it to me in the chat? Fantastic, a lot of folks got it. E then not G. So we've got environment then not gun control. Now the second rule mentions J and I, which we don't already have. We'll skip those, come back to them later when we can more easily link them on. Third rule mentions E as an environment. We've already got that on the diagram, so we'll link it to what we have. We've got either E or J or both, meaning we have to have at least one of the two. We might actually have both, that'd be okay. So. This idea is framed as a negative arrow positive. If you don't have environment, then you must have judicial. Contrapositive, if you don't have judicial, then you must have environment. We talked about this in depth in last week's class, so I'll save the explanation for that video. Fourth rule, if H and D, then G. We could do the fourth rule now. We could also do the second rule now and go back to that one because we've got J at this point. Doesn't matter which order you do it in at this point. I'll just do that last rule, the fourth one, and then come back to the second. So if we have both H and D, then we must have G. So H and D being in are sufficient to guarantee G. The two of them together form the sufficient condition. 
Meaning, if you lack at least one of those two, if, if you lack G, then you must lack at least one of those two. For this, I like to use a dotted arrow. If you don't have G, then you must have lacked at least one of H or D. So dotted arrow indicates ambiguity in the necessary condition. If G is out, then you must lack at least one of H or D. Dotted arrow indicates or in the necessary. I'm also going to include the word or there just to emphasize it, just like I use that plus sign and the bracket over here to indicate the and in the sufficient condition. Now the rule that we skipped, the second rule, unless she votes against J, she will vote for I. I went in depth on this last week. The simplest translation would be to take unless to equal if not. If not against J, then positive I. If not against is a double arrow. A double, excuse me, a double negative. If not against is a double negative, meaning positive. So in short, J requires I. I'll write this on the side briefly. If not against J, then I. If not is negative, against is negative. Together, they give us a positive. So positive J, then I would be the simplest way to go about that. So positive J, then I at the end of the top chain, contrapositive, not I, then J. And that's the main diagram. Any questions about the main diagram? We basically took each rule, took its contrapositive, and linked them together as we went. Now, this is useful. We can solve some questions with it, but there are a lot of common pitfalls when it comes to interpreting or reading this diagram. A lot of folks will start somewhere in the middle. Like, let's say if we learned as new information that E was in, what could we infer? What else would we know to be the case? So we're starting at this point on the chain. What else must be true? Anything to the right, exactly. So G is out, and then at least one of H or D will be out as well. So if we were told as new information, if E as an echo or environment is in, G is negative, and then at least one of H or D will be negative as well. Maybe both of them. We can't say for certain. But at least one of them is out. So meaning when E is in, there are at least two variables out. G, meaning gun control, and then at least one of H or D. The others we can't say. So immigration, judicial, we don't know. Can't say. I like to use a slash through variables to indicate negative because it's, it's harder to miss. If you use the little tilde, the little squiggle to indicate not, then you might lose it because it's small. So I think putting the slash through it, like the no smoking side, I think is the simplest and clearest way to go about it. But try it out and see if you can keep it clear for yourself and that's okay. But I find the formal logic notation that you might see in a logic textbook is maybe more academic and professional, but we're focused on practicality here given time constraints and, and such. So I would do the slash. So basically, takeaway here is that when you're looking to start in the middle, like with E, you can only go to the right 
we know about this, 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 but the what's happening here with I and J, big question mark, open-ended, we can't say for certain. And we'll encounter that issue as we go through the questions here. And yeah, it's a one-way street. The diagrams, the arrows are, the arrows are literally like on a one-way street sign pointing a certain direction, only go in that direction. So the questions. We covered number one last class, so I'm not going to go in depth on it right now unless folks would like me to. The big thing there basically to note is that one thing making it tougher is the negative in the question stem for number one. It specifically says, bills the legislator votes against. Very easy to miss. People typically think in, po think in positive terms than negative terms. In practice, it doesn't have to be that different in terms of your question solving method, but you want to be laser focused on the negatives when the question is negative focused. I'll leave it there. We may come back, but for now, I want to make sure we get through the others. And yeah, Ariel, general question on conditionals. Yeah. So um, earlier today, Steve, I was reading one of your blog posts about conditional statements. And there was one that literally like made my head spin. It was um, if not, or if Y, not Y, or if not X. Um, sorry, hold on, let me rephrase. If Y, not X, um, otherwise, I think X or something. It was really weird. I'll probably just type in the chat because I can't really remember it quite right at this moment, but it was just something I had never seen before. And I don't think I've ever seen it in a logic game or logical reasoning question and definitely not in reading comp. So my general question is, is there, do you have like a running list of most common conditional statements we can likely see on uh, in games or um, logical reasoning questions or, or anything, or a YouTube video or anything? Yeah, check out the workshop inside the course on contrapositives and conditional chains. That's actually a very closely related to this class tonight. It's building up to doing this kind of diagram. So if you're looking for the road to be able to diagram this main diagram here in terms of linking together conditionals, the contrapositives and conditional statements workshop goes in depth on all the most common types of rules you're going to see. What you're mentioning with the otherwise is not the most common. Okay. So it, it comes up sometimes. Short answer is it's a double arrow. Getting into that is beyond the scope of what I'm going to cover tonight. I can keep it in mind for the future to, to do a drill around it. If we have time tonight, I'll, I'll do a little something with it. But otherwise, basically, when you have X, blah, 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 otherwise not, then that's going to be a double arrow. Okay, perfect. I'll just Great question, though. You. Yeah, of course. Check out the workshop in the meantime, though. So... We covered number one last time. Going to skip it for now. We can come back later if we have time, though. I want to get to number two since we didn't cover it last time. So this is an if local question giving us a clear jumping off point. We are, we've got negative J for certain. So I would put, again, that little T chart with positive, negative. Left side is positive variables. Right side is negative variables. We're voting against J. So we know for a fact that J is negative. Now, I know you all know where to take this because we just did that in the example I brought up with positive E. So what else can we fill in here? We're kicking off that same chain reaction, right? So we know negative J for certain. That's right here on the diagram. We just read it forward. So do me a favor, type in the chat what happens next. What else can we infer based on the, reading this conditional chain? Yeah, so E's in. We've got that. So negative J, positive E. Folks are typing in, not G, H, not H, or not D. Exactly. So E is in, G is out, at least one of H or D is out as well. So at least one of H or D, again, 
maybe both, we can't say. Now we're being asked what cannot be true. What cannot be true. So it must be explicitly prohibited by what we have on our diagram, what we know to be the case based on our diagram, our little local diagram right here. So we can scan through the choices or we could theoretically prephrase. We could say, well, since E has to be in, E cannot be out. Since G has to be out, it cannot be in. Since at least one of H or D has to be out, they cannot both be in. One of the things I just said is actually the answer. Now, I'll lay out exactly what is impossible. I wouldn't do this on test day. This is just for illustrative purposes right now. I wrote down MBF must be false. This is the world of things we know must be false, AKA cannot be true. J cannot be in. Duh, because the question stem says, has to be out. E cannot be out. G cannot be in. And we cannot have both H and D in. This is the world of things we know cannot be the case. You could solve it this way. Scanning through the choices, Egg talks about defense. We have, what can we say about defense? Against both D and G, not showing up on our must be false diagram. In fact, we know that that could happen based on what we see on the left. D and G, right there, we see them both being out. That could work. So A is out. A is, a is the wrong answer. B, G, and H, same thing. They could both be out. C, H, and D, could they both be in? That's in our must-be-false diagram. It's our answer. To be thorough and go through all five, H and E, could they both, H and E, could they both be in? Neither of our diagrams shows that, but there's ambiguity around H's placement. So it's possible that we could have both in. We have E over here, H over there, but alternating with D is in defense. So could that happen? Yeah, maybe. Not appearing in our must be false diagram. E as an echo, E and F. F is a floater. We didn't do anything with F ever. In fact, we might have even forgotten it's a variable in this game, but it's up here at the top. It's a floater, could be anywhere. Bottom line is we see on our general diagram that at least one of H or D has to be out. So they cannot both be in. Any questions regarding this one? All right, let's go to the next. And I see Alana, I see you left a comment about in general about the diagram. Now, yeah, well, you wrote a typical approach to just write out the rules, but inferences, connections is what it's all about to work more efficiently. Making these chains can pave the way for you to solve it more smoothly because you're not constantly reinventing the wheel. Like you see here. The diagram for number three, for number uh, two that we just did, uh, uh, number three that we just did. Or we do, we just did number two, right? Yeah, it's um, it becomes apparent when you're just laying everything out at the start. You can quickly fill in these local T charts right away, and that's really the benefit here. If you just if you don't make a main diagram, then you're just going to constantly be manually connecting them throughout the course of the game which is a bit more inefficient. Better to do all the work up front, then you'll pave the way to solve the questions more efficiently. Now we have number three, general cannot be true question. General, global. You could skip this and come back to it at the end. It's possible that the work you do for numbers four, five, and six would help you because there are local questions in nature. 
But given just how powerful our main diagram is here, we can tackle it on the spot. And so I'll show you how I might do that going in. Question like this, there, all the choices are saying votes for neither this nor that. All the choices are framed that way. Votes for neither one variable nor the other variable, which is meaning that we'd have to have, that we cannot lack both, which is a pair of variables such that we could not lack both, meaning we would have to have at least one in. Again, a pair of variables where it's impossible to lack both, meaning at least one of the two must be in. At least one of the two in is referring to a negative arrow positive relationship. And that is exactly what that third rule of the game about E and J was saying, environment and judicial. Which appears over here and over here in our main diagram. We're looking for a pair of variables that has this style of relationship, a negative arrow positive. So environment and judicial would actually be a valid answer for this question, but that would be too easy. It does not come up. So a few approaches you could take here, one would be lay out other negative arrow positive relationships that you can see on the main diagram. Considering that they do not have to be adjacent or side by side or consecutive on the diagram. So E and J of course are consecutive adjacent side by side. There are others that are not side by side or adjacent yet still have that same negative arrow positive relationship. Adjacency or proximity doesn't matter on these diagrams. The logic carries throughout. So super tough question here. Does anybody see any other relationships like that negative arrow positive on this diagram, even when they're not side by side, jumping over a variable perhaps? Yes, you guys got it. Fantastic. So E and I, environment and immigration also have that same relationship. Well done. So E and I, not side by side, not adjacent, but still they also have that same negative arrow positive. Negative I requires positive E, contrapositive negative E requires positive I. So that is another pair of variables whose relationship is such that at least one of the two must always be in. And sure enough, that is one of the choices, choice B as in Bravo. It cannot be the case that the legislator votes for neither of those two, because if she does not vote for one, then she must vote for the other. Now, I approach this one more theoretically. An alternative way to do it would have been to scan through all five choices looking for those negative arrow positive relationships in the choices. So looking at choice A, gun and immigration, they have a negative arrow negative relationship. If you start with negative I, negative J, positive E, negative G. Negative, negative, not what we're looking for. That says that if I is out specifically, then G must also be out. Contrapositive, if G is in, then I would also be in. So A is gone. But B, we've got our hit. Negative I, positive E tells us at least what must be in. They cannot both be out. Scanning through the others, neither G nor H, they have a negative arrow, negative relationship or positive arrow positive. 
depending on how you look at it. With, of course, the consideration of the two variables in the sufficient up here, two ors and necessary down there, but either way, it's not what we want. Neither H nor F. Again, F is a floater. There is nothing about it in particular we have to be concerned with. And of course, H could be either in or out depending on the situation. Then last, F and I, same thing. F is a floater and immigration could be in or out depending on other factors. So B as in Bravo is our answer. Going to number four, if she votes against I. So another little T-chart. We fill in what we can going forward along the arrows. So if I is out, J is out as well. E is in. G is out. And then at least one of H or D must also be out. So the minimum number of the seven bills she must also vote against. So we've got at least four variables out right now. Is the answer four? We have four in the out column, considering it's at least one of H or D. But the question stem says also. Yeah. <laughs> LSAC loves to get people like that. So I, I was inspired. So if she votes against immigration, then she is also voting against J, G, and at least one of H or D. So yes, Dipali, it's three. And yeah, it's very rude. It's very tricky. They're very sneaky about this stuff. So you could get the logic totally right and get the question wrong because you missed the word also. That's why I'm putting it in the game here. So you encounter this concept here. You won't encounter it on test day for the first time. So those little keywords make the difference. Otherwise, though, it was just pretty much just following the chains and nothing more. See, once you've got the, the main diagrams, it's a question of following the chains again and again. Number five, she votes for G gun control. So now finally, we're dealing more with the top chain. If for gun control, I stop there right at the comma and start filling in everything I possibly can. So... E is out, J is in, and I is in. Of course, H and D, health and defense, we have no clue. Could be in, could be out. You want to make sure you're not going backwards. On that arrow, that's no good. Only forwards, like the one-way street. We're being asked, must be true. So right there, A, H or D, no clue, no idea what where they're doing. They could both be in, they could both be out. Or we could have a one in one, open-ended. For the same reason, B as in Bravo is out. No clue, health and defense could be anywhere. C, against judicial, no, because we know for a fact judicial is in, not out. But we do know where I is going. I for immigration, definitely in. So D as in delta is our answer. E as in echo is gone. Just a matter of making that main diagram. Number six, against judicial. And you saw we've basically done this already, right? I think there was even a question about it. Same as number two, same exact question, Stan. 
So here I have not been saving my work due to the space constraints of a tablet. But on test day, I would already have my little T chart previously drawn. I would already have J out, E in. G out at least one of H or D out as well. And we would have I as a floater, essentially for the specific scenario, F open-ended as well. So choices involving F or I are probably coulds. So they wouldn't be our answer. We're looking for something that as Dipali says, must be false. Could be a true except means must be false. So we're looking for something that is explicitly prohibited by our little local diagram here. So if you wanted to, you could once again, lay out a little must be false and say J in, E out, G in, and then H D just like before. You could do the exact same thing. As you could see, we're really dealing with the same thing twice. And once again, H and D both in would be prohibited by this question. Could not possibly be the case. So you see, I've actually asked the exact same question twice, just dressed up differently with other choices around it, different question stem around it. Before in number two, I said, cannot be true. In number six, I'm saying, could be true except. Same exact idea. Could be true except equals must be false. Questions around that? Finally, number seven. Oh, real quick, what was the answer? Oh. Yeah, Billy? What, what was the answer to number six? Number six was B as in Bravo. Oh, B, okay. We cannot have both H and D in because if J is out, then following the chain, E is in, G is out, at least one of H or D is out as well. Okay. Okay. So we cannot have both H and D in. So finally, number seven is a rule addition question. We're adding in a new rule to the game. In this case, so I would basically draw that onto the main diagram at this point. The rule specifically is saying, if for free trade, then against judicial activism. Contrapositive, if J is in, then F is out. So I would just insert it on the main diagram where it appears. So specifically, J in on top requires F out. Contrapositive, if F is in, then J is out. So I'll make some space by just putting that on the diagram. So F in, J out. You'll see it doesn't have a huge consequence except for telling us that F in can determine quite a bit because it kicks off almost the entirety of the bottom chain. So we just basically, once we've added this on, we treat it like any other game, following the arrows in the direction in which they're pointing. So this is a must be true except question. Four of them must be true. One of them is not necessarily true. So F was previously a floater. Now it determines quite a bit. So just scanning through the choices. If F is in, then G is out. Is that a must? Yeah, F in, J out, E in, G out. 
So F is kicking off that chain of reaction, just following it from the start on the bottom chain, going as far as we can take it. A is a must, we can eliminate it. Looking at B as in Bravo, against environment, then against free trade, negative E as an echo, top chain, negative E going forward leads to negative F. So once again, that is a must, we can eliminate it because we're looking for something that is not a must. Looking at C as in Charlie, if against immigration, then for free trade. So a negative I at the start of the top chain gives us negative J, positive E, negative G, and so on. It never circles back around to F. That is not okay because you can't go backwards on an arrow, only follow in the direction in which they're pointing. We have no arrows, direct or indirect, that bring us from negative I on the top left over here to positive F. They are unrelated. You'd have to go backwards on this arrow, which is no good. So C is our answer. It is not a must. It's open-ended. Negative I has no impact on F. Going through the others to be thorough, D is in delta, choice D. Negative J, then negative G. That does follow on the bottom chain going forward. So that's out. And then negative I, then against at least three other bills. Note that in choice E is an echo, we have the word also and the word other, circling back to that question from earlier. So negative I tells us negative J, negative G, and then at least one of H or D as well. To put that in our little T-chart framework, if we have I in the out column, we have J in the out column, G in the out column, at least one of H or D in the out column as well. If you want to be thorough, you could put E in the positive. I didn't bother because I'm focused on negatives for solving this particular question. But anyway, aside from the I, we have J, G, and at least one of H or D. So three others also are negative in addition to I. So that is also a must, meaning it's not our answer because we're looking for must be true except. So I've been thorough here going through all five, but of course, C as in Charlie is the answer because it is it, because it is not a must. And that's the game. Questions around it? Does this feel like it's doable? I hope so. The key is just really to get good at creating these kinds of diagrams and then get good at interpreting these kinds of diagrams. There's a lot of work to learn them at first, but it's well worth it because it can make the questions a breeze. Yeah, comment, Ariel? Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed this session, especially since it plays off the one from last week where we spent time um, setting up uh, this this chain that you have presented um, on the, the, the screen here. Um, but I would definitely like to see for any future sessions, um, doing the same setup, maybe a two week setup where we're doing um, advanced linear games or matching or some other kind of game. Granted, this is in and out, which I think is very similar to the ones that we'll actually see um, from LSAC, but um, we could look at other game types that would be useful. And I know you already have tons of videos explaining games, but I think perhaps it could be a good um, exercise to have you do them live so that we can all um, comment and or ask questions while you're going through the games. Um, that's the comment. 
Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks. For, I'm always looking for ideas on future class formats to change it up. So if I understood correctly, there's two things you're looking for. One is to do this two week spread with other game types, like you said, advanced linear. So ordering games with multiple levels, maybe do the, we can really, I like to go in depth on things as you see. So we can spend a whole hour on a setup, another whole hour just on questions. And you want to see that for a variety of different game types. And then separately, you want to see me go through a game live. Yes, exactly. Um, because like I said, your YouTube videos on going through different games are really great, but sometimes I will watch the video and I have a question and I don't, I mean, I can ask everyone in the um, course, but it'd be nice to ask you like live or ask everyone else um, at the same time. Cool. So if I just want to understand more thoroughly, so I, I apologize for sticking on this. How would that fine. differ from what we just did now? Because just now I did walk through a game live. Um, so the only difference would be just doing a, the same thing, but with a different game type. Okay. Yeah, no, That's absolutely. It. I mean, I want to do it for all different game types. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so this is something I'll definitely be adding more of in the future. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No, thank you. Always love getting ideas. Always love getting feedback. Really appreciate um, all the feed, all the folks who filled out that feedback form after last night's class. Really useful to get the feedback, both positive and negative. I want to hear all of it because I'm just looking to make things better with time. And um, yeah, uh, Matthew, thanks for the comment on the the clean diagramming here. Um, there's a trick to it. I'll tell you if you all want to hear the trick. Uh, so there's a white. There are some whiteboard apps that have something called auto snap. Let me see if I could pull it up here. A little behind the scenes. So you see here under settings, there's ink to shape is toggled on. I'm not going to touch it because I don't want to mess with it. But basically, ink to shape is on, and then object snapping is on. And those are two little features that help to clean up what might happen organically if you're not using that feature. So I was previously using whiteboard apps to not contain that, and it definitely looked more like the toddler diagrams. And so that's a little trick. This is the Microsoft. A whiteboard app. So I would look up that one specifically if you want to keep them clean. This could help you make your study groups smoother, but on test day itself, of course, there's nothing like electronic in terms of what you're drawing. You're going to be on your paper regardless, which is easier to make clean. But for the apps, this is my favorite so far. But if you all do some playing around and find something better, let me know. I'm always looking to improve what I'm drawing here. So folks, thanks again for all the great questions and great uh, participation. Uh, if nothing else, that'll be it for this evening. We've got the student study group happening now. Link should be in your email from about an hour ago. It's the same 24 seven uh, join link for the sessions. Any questions, always reach out. I'm happy to help. We've got two TA presentations tomorrow night. We've got Alyssa who will be sharing some insights and ideas around setting up your own study group and how to organize your study group once you have it, that'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern. And then at 9 p.m. Eastern, Ariel's got a TA presentation on logical reasoning, necessary and sufficient assumption questions. So make sure you tune into both of those. I'll see you all tomorrow night. Thanks again for joining. Good night, everybody. <laughs>